Good morning, everybody. In June 2016, the then Chief Constable, Sir George Hamilton, asked John Boucher to independently lead Operation Canova, the investigation into a range of activities surrounding the alleged army agent known as State Knife. This decision followed a referral from the Public Prosecution Service after they had received information from the Office of the Police Ombudsman. In appointing Mr Boucher as Chief Constable last year, the Northern Ireland Policing Board agreed that he would then recuse himself of decisions such as that relating to the publication of the interim report, so that responsibility now sits with me. Having worked carefully through the protocol on publication with all relevant stakeholders, I am pleased that we are able to publish the interim report today and ensure that the families and loved ones of victims are afforded this vital next step in their quest for the truth they deserve. I would like to thank the Operation Canova team for the thorough and professional investigation they have conducted. The report outlines the challenges faced in conducting legacy investigations, but also highlights that no matter how difficult such investigations can be, they must remain victim-focused, and the needs of the families who have lost loved ones must always be to the fore during any such investigations. The interim report serves as a stark reminder of the pain and suffering continuing to be felt by all of the families of those killed and injured during the Troubles. The report highlights once again the enormous challenges being faced by security forces during the Troubles and acknowledges they overwhelmingly sought to act in the public interest and that their immense sacrifice and the losses that they suffered should never be forgotten. The deficiencies and failings regarding the handling and dissemination of intelligence by police, many of which have been highlighted repeatedly in the past, have been addressed by the restructuring of our intelligence systems and processes through the formation of our crime department. The report makes a number of recommendations and we shall share the report with our partners and HM Government and will continue to play our part in funding, finding a lasting solution to our troubled past. The Northern Ireland Troubles Legacy and Reconciliation Act of 2023 will see the establishment of the Independent Commission for Reconciliation and Information Recovery, and we will support this new body once it commences operations on 1st of May this year. I will now ask Sir Ian Livingstone, the officer in overall command of Operation Canova, followed by the author, Mr Boucher, to introduce the interim report. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am in Livingston, uh, and I took over as officer in overall command of Canova uh, late last year, uh, having retired as Scotland's Chief Constable in August of 2023. Now, since the inception of Operation Canova, I have worked alongside Chief Constable John Boucher, initially as part of the Canova Independent Steering Group, and then later and in addition as Chair of the Canova Governance Board. I therefore have a good understanding of the complex work carried out and the challenges faced. I fully endorse the findings and recommendations in today's report, and it is only right that they are presented by John Boucher this morning as it is his report, it's his insight, his findings and his recommendations. Before John takes us through the report, I want briefly to outline the next steps for Operation Canova. This is the interim report, initially designed to ensure Canova's key findings would be made public in advance of any prosecutorial decisions given the overwhelming legitimate public interest in the matters investigated. The Public Prosecution Service for Northern Ireland has now publicly announced all of its decisions relating to the State Knife case files submitted by Operation Canova, and there will be no State Knife related prosecutions. I must stress nevertheless that our work does not end today. We will now move to providing families with individual reports to provide clarity of what happened to their loved ones, to provide the truth that they have been denied for so long. Those family reports will be presented by our team 
to individual families through private briefings. We will then move to publish a final report which will tell the full story of Operation Canova's investigation into the agent steak knife. In addition to the steak knife related investigations, I consider it important to underline that the costs of and resources allocated to Operation Canova also cover a number of other critical investigations and reviews for which we have responsibility. Operation Mizzenmast, the murder of Jean Smith Campbell in 1972. Operation Turma, the murder of three RUC officers killed in the Kinigo embankment bombing of 1982. And the analytical review that came from the Barnard judgment relating to the so-called Glenann series being conducted under our Operation Denton. Following this morning's briefings, I will, of course, be available to take any questions in regard to Operation Canova's next steps. But at this stage, I will pass over to Chief Constable John Boucher. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, so we're here today releasing the Canova Interim Report, which I submitted to the Police Service of Northern Ireland for publication shortly before I was appointed Chief Constable last October. I want to begin by reminding everyone of the overriding mission of Canova, which is delivering the truth to legacy families about what happened to their loved ones. Many of these families have endured endless delays, setbacks and unfulfilled promises in their quest for the truth. Their strength, determination and dignity over many years is perhaps the most inspirational aspect of legacy and is a lesson to us all. It is legacy families who gave up the most under the Good Friday Agreement and we owe it to them to listen to their stories, acknowledge their loss, and tell them what actually happened. The Director of Public Prosecutions announced final decisions on the last batch of Canova investigation files last week. As a result, the Canova team, now led by Sir Ian Livingstone, can proceed to complete its final report and also individual family reports for those most directly affected. This process is actively underway. I produced the Canova interim report to allow certain key findings to be made public and in particular to confirm what many legacy families have suspected for a long time about certain patterns of state intervention and non-intervention in the mistreatment torture and murder of people accused of being state agents during the Troubles. Concerns were raised with me that the Government Command Paper on Legacy, issued in July 2021, would ultimately mean that the Canova findings might not be publicly reported. I began writing this, this report when that paper was published to ensure the findings set out today were released, notwithstanding new legacy legislation or any no prosecution decisions. I strongly believe it is now time to bring the uncertainty and doubt these families have faced to an end and say to them officially, you are not mad, this was happening and this should not have happened. The interim report does this. It also sets out lessons learned by Canova that I hope will be benefit to the Independent Commission for Reconciliation and Information Recovery. During the Troubles, state agents were at the heart of a deadly battle between the security forces and the provisional IRA. The security forces used agents to provide them with intelligence about the IRA and other groups, and this played a vital role in disrupting and, and degrading its capabilities. Society owes many of these agents and their handlers a huge debt of gratitude. 
In response, the IRA did everything it could to deter and punish possible agents. In particular, the group's internal security unit was responsible for punishment beatings and shootings, securing coerced confessions and the abduction, torture and murder of suspected agents. At times, the families of those accused of being agents, including women, children, the elderly, and even those with learning disabilities, were also subjected to violence and humiliation by the internal security unit, as well as being intimidated and ostracised by the Republican leadership. No one should be in any doubt that the wrongs done by the IRA's internal security unit and those responsible for its operation were utterly, utterly abhorrent. It was the IRA leadership who commissioned the unit and the abuse, torture and murder of so many. There was often very little interest in the truth. This was about deterring people from being agents. These acts were perpetrated to intimidate and subjugate the community. During the Troubles, the security forces operated in a uniquely challenging environment. When provided with secret intelligence about the plans and intentions of the Provisional IRA and other such groups, they had to assess risks and consequences with limited information, guidance or training. They did so under exceptionally stressful conditions and extreme time pressures and were sometimes presented with dilemmas that had no right answer because protecting one individual would expose another. Mistakes were inevitable. However, a lack of regulation, oversight and leadership were also important factors. In particular, the absence of an effective legal and policy framework governing the use of agents during the Troubles was a very serious failing. It put lives at risk, it left those on the front line exposed and let down, and it fostered a maverick culture for some where agent handling was sometimes seen as high stakes, dark art, and was practiced off the books. This was combined with the evolution of a situation whereby intelligence and investigatory functions were seen as separate and the security forces repeatedly withheld and did not action information about threats to life, abductions and murders in order to protect agents from compromise. As a result, murders that could and should have been prevented were allowed to take place with the knowledge of the security forces and those responsible for murder were not brought to justice and were instead left free to reoffend again. Indeed, we could not find any troubles related cases where a prosecution was brought in connection with a victim who was murdered because they're accused or suspected of being an agent. That of itself should have sounded huge alarm bells to those in charge of the agencies involved. Should any part of the security forces receive information today suggesting a real and immediate threat to life, they would be bound to act in order to protect life. State Knife was the code name for an army agent within the IRA's internal security unit, whose true identity has been the subject of public claims, speculation and litigation for some 20 years. While State Knife was undoubtedly a valuable asset who provided intelligence about the IRA at considerable risk to himself, claims that he was responsible for saving countless or hundreds of lives are hugely exaggerated. Most importantly, these claims belie the fact that Steak Knife was himself involved 
in very serious and wholly unjustifiable criminality whilst operating as an agent, including murders. The claims about countless lives being saved by steak knife are inherently implausible and should have rung further alarm bells. Any serious security and intelligence professional hearing an agent being likened to the goose that laid the golden eggs, as steak knife was, should be on the alert, not, bec not least because the comparison is rooted in fables and fairy tales. To address speculation to the contrary, I now make clear steak knife was one individual. We cannot know every occasion when information provided by steak knife was used to avoid or prevent harm, but Canova has recovered and reviewed some 90% of the written intelligence reports attributable to him, and my estimate of the number of lives saved in reliance on this information is between high single figures and low double figures and nowhere, nowhere near hundreds. Crucially, this is not a net estimate because it does not take account of the lives lost as a consequence of Steak Knife's continued operation as an agent. From what I have seen, I think it probable that this resulted in more lives being lost than were saved. Most fundamentally, even if it were possible, accurately and reliable to say that a particular agent within a terrorist group did more good than harm, the morality and legality of agents doing any harm with the knowledge of or on behalf of the state is something that we would never, ever allow today. State Knife's identity has been disclosed to Canova, subject to obligations of confidentiality which I remained bound by and I cannot make his name public without official authority. Thus far, the government has refused to give such authority and so State Knife is not named in this interim report. However, this position, in my view, is no longer tenable. I expect the government to authorise Canova to confirm State Knife's identity in the final report. This authorisation will not require any unique departure from its neither confirm nor deny policy in connection with the identification of state agents. The policy historically has allowed for exemptions. I completely agree that state agents need to be protected by a cloak of anonymity and secrecy. Otherwise, they will not come forward, but this cannot confer immunity or a right to act with impunity, and no agent can lawfully be given an absolute assurance of perpetual anonymity, come what may. The existing strict application of NCND amounted to a de facto immunity from criminal investigation and thus prosecution of agents suspected of serious crimes, including multiple murders. Where an agent has been the subject of suspicions resulting in their relocation, or has died, or has been the subject of allegations or findings of serious criminality, the strength of the case for protecting their identity, or suggesting its confirmation might damage national security is, in my view, considerably weakened. Society and the courts will generally support NCND based on the very reasonable assumption that the agent and security agencies have acted properly and within the rule of law. Where this is not the case, NCND should fall aside. Security agencies argue that to step away from NCND will put agents' lives at risk, prevent recruitment and retention of those agents. Yet, it is those agencies that in these cases failed to protect agents who risked their lives for the state. 
that irony should not be lost on anyone. And it should, re it should be remembered that not all those accused of being agents were agents. There are striking similarities between the case of State Knife and that of Brian Nelson, another army agent who was active in Northern Ireland at around about the same time, who was falsely claimed to have saved countless lives, who was, who was responsible for very serious criminality and was officially identified as an agent. If the government fails to recognise that this case is indeed an exception and refuses to authorise publication of the final, unredacted Canova report, including the identity of State Knife, its reasons will be rightfully questioned in the media, in Parliament and most likely the courts. The Canova Interim Report makes ten recommendations. Firstly, to establish on a statutory basis and with express, express statutory powers and duties an independent framework and apparatus for investigating Northern Ireland legacy cases. Secondly, subject all public authorities to an unqualified and enforceable legal obligation to cooperate with and disclose information and records to those charged with conducting Northern Ireland legacy investigations under a new structure. Third, enact legislation to provide procedural time limits enforced by judicial case management to handle cases passing from a new legacy structure to the criminal justice system. Fourth, review and reform the resourcing and operating practices of the Public Prosecution Service of Northern Ireland in connection with Northern Ireland legacy cases. Five, the longest day, the 21st of June, should be designated as a day when we remember those lost, injured or harmed as a result of the Troubles. Six, review, codify and define the proper limits of the NCND policy as it relates to the identification of agents and its application in the context of the Northern Ireland legacy cases predating the Good Friday Agreement. Seven, review the security classification of previous Northern Ireland legacy reports in order that their contents, at the very least their principal conclusions and recommendations, can be declassified and made public. The Public Prosecution Service of Northern Ireland should pay due regard to the views, interests and well-being of victims and families when considering the public interest factors relevant to prosecution decisions in Northern Ireland legacy cases. I'd like to finish with the final two recommendations. The United Kingdom Government should apologise to the Canova families for the failures of the security forces to protect the lives of their loved ones, investigate the crimes committed against them and treat them with the fairness, compassion, respect and transparency that they deserved. The former Prime Minister Lord Cameron issued public apologies in the wake of the Bloody Sunday and Pat Fanukan reports. In my view, the same thing should happen here. Finally, it was the IRA's internal security unit that brutalised and murdered these victims that it accused, often wrongly, of being agents. The Republican leadership should accept its accountability for these heinous crimes and apologise for the IRA's abduction, torture and murder of those it accused or suspected of being agents during the Troubles and acknowledge the loss and unacceptable intimidation bereaved and surviving families have suffered. In concluding, I want to thank the independent Canova governance groups 
that have steadfastly overseen all of this work. Each member of the Governance Board, the Independent Steering Group and the Victim Focus Group has discharged their role with true independence, dedication and a focus on ensuring the work was diligently conducted and victim focused. Baroness Nula O'Lone to my right and Judith Thompson to my left are here today representing the Independent Steering Group and Victim Focus Group. And Sir Ian is here both as the new officer in overall command of Operation Canova and in his role as a member of the Governance Board. I also want to thank the various bodies and professionals who've conducted thorough and independent reviews that I commissioned of Canova. Their respective findings are available on the Canova website. And to finish, this report is dedicated to the victims and the families. To those we've come to know and those whom through their loved ones we now feel we know. I wish to thank each one who has spoken to us so openly and we remember with fondness those who sadly have passed away during our work. Each person we spoke with helped shape and inspire the work of Canova. That includes many families that we've met beyond the scope of Canova. Each legacy victim and family deserve to know what happened in their case. What each legacy victim has endured should be acknowledged and where the information exists, they should be told what happened. There is a responsibility on all of us in authority to make sure this occurs. Thank you, and I'm now happy to take some questions. So firstly, uh, Alison, the, um, the cooperation of, of all public bodies in legacy cases should occur without hesitation and should be absolute. I set out in my report challenges that we faced. These are challenges that previous legacy investigations have also encountered. And in the report, and I would point you to the section where Previous people have led les legacy inquiries and had faced similar challenges. It's those reports, such as the Stalker and Sampson report, Stevens 1 and 2 report, the Blelock report, that in my view should be reviewed, declassified and made public. We as a democratic society are often judged on how we deal with allegations of wrongdoing against agencies for the state. And any democratic society that values human rights and the rights of its citizens, who it's there to protect, should ensure that those rights include proper scrutiny of agencies that are responsible for looking after us. With regards to the individual steak knife and when he was stood down, we're not going to answer questions about that at this stage, but in the final report, it is our intention to set out in more detail the history of the particular individual. So I didn't hear the last bit of that. Sorry, Julie, just repeat the last bit of your question. I say, given the cost mobilised to be saved, 
Yeah. Is being reduced to be referred to practically as a start to remove a deadly drug. So I don't believe Steak Knife is owed any debt of gratitude, and let's be very clear on that. Uh, it's the victims of the crimes of agents who committed murder and other serious offences that we should focus our um, understanding and attention on today. And we need to be very clear about that. With regards to the value of any intelligence of any agent, it's vital, it's vital that we are able to recruit um, and work with agents who seek to help us protect society from terrorism and organised crime. But we do that on the basis of two premises for me, that those agents and the security forces who deploy those agents and recruit them act with propriety and within the rule of law. And that's what society expects of us. And in these cases, that did not happen. So I think the iron approach, if you will, to neither confirm nor deny, without a doubt, has prevented not only the agent state knife, but other agents and their activities from being investigated. And the way I'd describe it is the policy of NC NCND is applied internally to investigations as much as it is externally to members of the press or bodies seeking to find out information. And that, where there, is any, where there is any legitimate concerns about agents committing crimes, there should be no immunity from investigation. And that was unacceptable. Well, I don't accept that because on the report sets out, we achieved actually far higher levels of evidential recovery than I expected. And very compelling evidence was provided to the Public Prosecution Service. And look, let me deal with this particular element. The Public Prosecution Service has an incredibly difficult job. They are under-resourced. But their approach to these files, and it's set out very clearly in the report, is not an approach I'm accustomed to for such serious matters. <laughs> there should be a collegiate approach to examining the evidence to see where the strengths and weaknesses of those case files might lie. Such an approach that would happen in all serious cases, and has happened with people around this table, did not occur in this case. I think that predominantly is because of the lack of resource for the PPS. So in my view, and I'll say Freddie Scapatici should have been prosecuted for offences, and he was not prosecuted, and in my view, that is something that forever victims, certain victims, will be regretful about. Um, what I will say, with the introduction of the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act in 2000 and the modernisation of policing and the security forces, 
the accountability measures, the oversight that's now in place around agent recruitment, handling, deployment, would mean that these types of activities should never happen, certainly in the United Kingdom today. We mustn't forget that at the time these events occurred, there was no framework and it was uniquely dangerous for the security forces. I need to underscore that. And they reached out for support. In my report, I talk about efforts by the security forces to seek a legal framework to help them deal with the unique and hostile operating environment in Northern Ireland. That support was not provided. Does this sort of activity occur elsewhere in the world? I would hope it doesn't, but I fear it does. But certainly, none of these activities um, could occur today in the United Kingdom. And that includes Northern Ireland, of course. So, two things to answer that question. Firstly, the focus of the Canova investigations was the agent steak knife. That individual was the person that the entire investigation uh, looked at with regards to his activities as an agent and his criminality. I think that the evidence that we did recover and that was put before the prosecuting authorities was considerable and compelling and I think if we apply the recommendation that I suggest that we review how those files are examined in the future not only will there not be the delays that those families have suffered because that's further traumatization of those families but potentially potentially we might have seen prosecutions I will also point you to the perjury section in the report, which sets out again the truth about what happened with regards to the affidavits um, that involved Freddie Scappatici. So look at the report, it will take time to digest it, but I think the evidential, evidence, evidential collection was significant, it was above what I expected, and I think we're all disappointed that there weren't prosecutions of steak knife. But again, I say this finally on that point. It's an incredibly difficult proposition to prosecute legacy cases because of the time that's passed. Certain people are no longer alive that are required to provide the continuity of evidence. Some documents no longer exist. So it is a really difficult thing to do. So I have sympathy with the Public Prosecution Service. They have highlighted previously the lack of resource to deal with legacy and specifically actually with the Canova files that were submitted to them. And I think it's another example of where legacy families, whether it's civil cases, the coronial cases in certain circumstances or criminal investigations, where we failed those legacy families. So some of that, some of that detail, we're, we're working with families now to give them information. Some of that detail uh, will wait the final report. And I want to just make another thing clear. This report is high level around what we've discovered. 
the detail that Ian and the team are now giving to the families. And in fact, we've given families detail throughout the lifetime of Operation Canova. It's for the families to hear first and foremost. And there'll be nothing in the final report with regards to any detail that hasn't been agreed by those families as well. Okay. So collusion is an interesting um, and synonymous word with legacy. Lord Stevens, who has been a great supporter of this investigation, um, first introduced that term, I think predominantly through frustration because he was um, lied to. Information that he should have received was not passed to him. And Lord Stevens makes comments in the report, which again I'd ask you to um, take a look at. I'm a person that believes in due process. It's very difficult to prove collusion or disprove collusion. Our job as investigators, as detectives, is to show the evidence where there is criminality. And if there is malfeasance in a public office, or members of security forces are involved in murders, in the way of aiding, abetting, or conspiring with agents, then we should deal with them for those substantive criminal offences. But I understand why people have become so wedded to the term. But I think that you need to show, through proper investigations, rigorous examination of the facts, where there is actually wrongdoing or criminality. I leave it for other people to judge on what I've said today, whether this is collusion or not. It's certainly been wrong, and it should never have happened. Jude, sorry. I will say very clearly is to engage with, listen to, acknowledge and respect these families. I've seen correspondence they've received from organisations, the efforts they've gone to to try and find out what happened to their loved ones. And this is not just Canova cases. And the failings of us as the authorities to provide them with the answers that often we have is the biggest lesson that I think broadly in wider UK society in GB is not properly understood. And we can't afford to continue with that direction. So on the figures, I really want to leave that to the final report, the detail, uh, and the first people to be told some of those details with the families. With regards to the ICRIR and the judgment um, by Judge Coton last week, that was around the immunity element of the bill. I understand that the uh, government are appealing that element of the judgment with regards to the Commission, though, if I can call it the Commission for Ease, it's led by Sir Declan Morgan, uh, a previous Lord Chief Justice here. And Sir Declan introduced the five-year plan for inquests for families. 
his authenticity, the genuine intent that he has to make the commission work, I think is undoubted. The background of the legislation that has created the commission does cause families great concern. But what I can say as the Chief Counsel of PSNI is that the PSNI will cooperate with that commission. We will give that commission unfettered access to information. So I would encourage families to engage with the commission. And when we began Canova, I remember, I remember going to meetings with groups of families who had never met before, one particular meeting in a solicitor's office, and we got shouted at quite a lot because nobody knew who we were and they'd been let down so often they thought this was another artificial um, investigation that would go nowhere. What I'd appeal for families to do is give the Commission a chance to do its work. But I'm very conscious of the concerns that families and victims groups have about the Commission. But I remember all of the scepticism about Operation Canova. And I don't think there's any alternative, unless somebody can point me to something, at the moment with regards to families getting any information through that sort of process. So firstly, if I can, about the Public Prosecution Service. Those files were with the Public Prosecution Service for a very long time. But the lawyers that were looking at those files, as I understand it, were engaged in lots of other work that they had to do. Because of the bandwidth of those lawyers, they didn't have the time to dedicate to look at those files in a consistent, protracted way. They were constantly having to revisit the files when they literally had some spare time. That again, I think, is a reflection on the challenges that have been faced by legacy families. With regards to culpability, if I understand your question correctly, I want to make clear the sacrifices, and again, please read the report uh, in, in more detail, slower time. The sacrifices made by the security forces in keeping people safe here was incredible. The RUC was the most dangerous police force in the world, in the world to be a member of. But where we got things wrong, what sets us apart from the terrorists is that we are open to scrutiny and we accept that we got things wrong. And for too long, in this particular regard, we have not accepted we got things wrong. Well, can I just say again, we got this wrong. But that should not detract from the huge effort of the security forces to keep society safe during the Troubles. No, I haven't. Freddie Scappucci, she's named in the report. He is directly linked with Operation Canova and has been throughout, so I have not done that. How 
So I think even today is a milestone for legacy. There have been milestones for legacy before, however, when reports have been provided, and I draw your attention again to the section of the report that we published today that describes previously legacy previous legacy investigations. The momentum that we have achieved, the information that we have given, cannot be lost. And I do think that people are listening to the rationale that people were not going mad, this was happening, and it's time that we accepted the errors that were made and we told the families the truth. So I described in my opening remarks, Sean, what I think needs to take place. I could not be clearer, I do not think, and I hope that now occurs.